Bonsoir à tous. Merci d'être encore si nombreux euh, passé minuit. Mais euh, je ne vous cache pas que cette, le, le titre de cette session finale m'a beaucoup intrigué au début. Le monde d'après-demain. Euh, ce n'est pas le monde de demain, ce n'est pas le monde du futur, c'est le monde d'après-demain. J'ai un peu réfléchi et j'ai compris en fait ce qui se passe, c'est que demain est toujours décevant. Les lendemains qui chantent, on le sait, n'existent pas, car demain est toujours trop encombré d'aujourd'hui pour complètement se déployer. On veut toujours que demain soit radicalement différent, et beaucoup mieux qu'aujourd'hui, et en fait il est souvent que très très peu différent d'aujourd'hui, et parfois moins bien. C'est logique. Pour embrasser la nouveauté et s'affranchir des réflexes, pour penser librement, il ne faut pas s'embarrasser d'une dose trop grande de présent. Trop proche d'aujourd'hui, demain est condamné à n'être qu'un aujourd'hui lifté en quelque sorte. On va se hasarder à une comparaison politique. En fait, demain, c'est un peu social-démocrate. Demain, c'est centriste. À minuit, je me suis dit qu'ici, vous n'aviez pas franchement envie d'un débat sur le centrisme. C'est pour cela qu'on a pris euh, avec nos deux, nos deux invités le, le parti d'enjamber ce demain et de parler du monde d'après-demain. Un monde qui est du coup suffisamment éloigné du nôtre pour que nous puissions ce soir débattre avec légèreté et liberté sans l'entrave de ce qu'on appelle trop souvent la réalité et qui est en fait l'inertie de notre propre trajectoire. Une trajectoire, ça se change, à condition de savoir où l'on va, pourquoi on y va et d'avoir envie de ce que l'on va y trouver. Et ce qu'on y trouve dans le futur, dans le passé, au bout de cette trajectoire, ce ne sont pas seulement des nouvelles technologies, des casques de réalité virtuelle et du numérique partout. Ce sont des pratiques réelles qui résonnent avec ces technologies, des lois nouvelles, des façons différentes de vivre le monde. En deux mots et pour résumer, demain, c'est aujourd'hui plus un casque de réalité virtuelle. Le monde d'après-demain, c'est des technologies, mais c'est surtout la politique qui va avec. Et c'est de ça dont on va discuter ce soir. Pour discuter de ce monde d'après-demain, nous avons la chance d'avoir deux personnalités avec nous qui incarnent ces trajectoires en mouvement, qui mêlent technologie et politique. Deux personnalités qui, vous allez le découvrir, désirent le futur et aiment le penser. Audrey Tang, tout d'abord, qui du coup a disparu. Elle aime tellement le futur qu'elle est partie avec son casque de réalité virtuelle. Audrey est une hackeuse civique, comme elle se présente. Elle est programmeuse, elle est militante pour la démocratie à Taïwan. Elle est à la retraite aussi, ça ne se voit pas, mais en fait, c'est ce qu'elle dit. C'est-à-dire qu'en fait, elle se consacre principalement à des projets du tiers secteur, du militantisme politique, des technologies au service de la démocratie. Blaise Aguera et Arcas, bonsoir. Ensuite, donc, euh, ingénieur chez Google, ex de Microsoft, ça a été un, un transfert comme on en fait dans la technologie. Il est un spécialiste de ce qu'on appelle l'apprentissage automatique, le machine learning, de la façon dont les ordinateurs apprennent, progressent, collaborent avec les humains pour l'augmenter. Ils vont tous les deux commencer par nous présenter justement leur après-demain à eux et puis nous aurons un, un échange et on prendra quelques questions de la salle. Je vais résumer en anglais parce qu'il y a des histoires de, de traduction. Donc normalement, vous avez des casques pour la traduction. En revanche, pour nos deux invités, je vais résumer ce que je viens de dire. Uh, Blaise, the, we are talking about the day after tomorrow because tomorrow is crap, because it's too close from today. The day after tomorrow is much more free and cool. It's full of new technologies and politics. And so you will talk about uh, the day after tomorrow because you are fun and cool and nobody wants a crap debate past midnight here in the Quai d'Orsay. Blaise, vous allez vous présenter un petit peu, justement. Qu'est-ce que vous faites chez Google? What are you doing at uh, Google, Blaise? Okay. Uh, at, at Google, I work on machine intelligence. And um, so my, my group is, uh, is, part of, is part of a large organization of more than a thousand people called Research and Machine Intelligence. And uh, a big part of the goal of that group as a whole is to advance the technologies that are essentially starting to confer capabilities that are modeled or inspired after biological brains on machines. Uh, so machine learning is the, the previous iteration of this kind of technology. We often call it machine intelligence these days. Um, my, my own group within this larger group focuses very much on machine intelligence on devices and on the edge rather than in the data center. Uh, and the, the reason that, that I've been very much focused on machine intelligence on devices 
is that I believe that uh, if we think about the day after tomorrow, we, uh, we really are headed for a world in which we um, – sorry, is that, is that better? Yeah. <laughs> I believe that we're, we're headed for a world in which our technology is uh, highly integrated into our bodies. And I don't want for that world to be one in which we are all part of a single giant supercomputer, to put it bluntly. Uh, I, I think that it's, it's very important that our personal technology extend us as people. And, uh, and in order for that to be the case, we need to not only develop technologies that are, that are interesting and powerful with respect to the, the server and the data center, but also develop a, a separate set of technologies that enable capabilities that can run uh, without connections to, to the data center. Et est-ce que ce type de technologies, que, donc qui sont des technologies personnelles capables d'augmenter les capacités de l'être humain et de respecter l'être humain en tant qu'être humain, on en trouve déjà des, des traces dans la vie de tous les jours uh, These kind of technologies that uh, you have just described, uh, is it possible to find that kind of technologies in nowadays in, our, in the shops Yes, yes it is. Um, So, for example, one of the, one of the things that my, my group makes is the, uh, the, deep, the deep neural networks that look at photos and analyze what's in them, and, uh, and these algorithms are able to tag the contents of the photos. And this is a, a capability that is very, very new in computer science. I mean, three years ago, four years ago, it was, it was impossible. Um, saying things like, you know, this is a, a girl holding a kitten on a sofa, something like this. And the interesting thing about those algorithms is that the neural networks that, that do this are small enough and fast enough now that they can fit on the device. And that means, for example, that when you take photos, they can be tagged on your phone without you having to first upload them. You have, you have used a, a word, neural network, yes. uh, réseau de neurones, c'est un mot, uh, réseau de neurones, et qui revient beaucoup dans ce que vous dites. Comment on pourrait décrire cette technologie qui apparemment est centrale dans ce que vous faites How would you describe that technology So, um, in the beginning of, of computer science, uh, the, the, the fathers of computer science, uh, John von Neumann, Alan Turing, were very, very interested in brains and in thinking as well as in computation and mathematics. And, and so the, the origins of, of computational neuroscience and the study of neurons and the creation of computers, these origins were very tightly intertwined. Uh, in fact, uh, in, in Turing's original paper in 1948, which many people see as the, the dawn of computer science, he laid out two different approaches to computation. One of them was based on the serial execution of instructions one after the other. Uh, this is the Turing machine that everybody understands as the basis for the computer now. But he also talked about a different model for computation involving networks of artificial neurons that are connected together in a, in a grid or in a graph in an arbitrary uh, relationship that allows data to flow through. Si, si je comprends bien, ça veut dire qu'il y a un modèle euh, où on essaie de, on est plutôt dans la force brute de calcul, brute force of yes. computation, and uh, l'autre modèle est plutôt euh, justement d'essayer de reproduire les, les modes de fonctionnement du cerveau humain to, uh, to, uh, to, to the mimic human the, the brain, uh, the human brain. Is that correct? Yes, yes. The, the brute force approach is one that's based on the idea of mathematical calculation in series, in sequence. And that model of computation allows you to do things like uh, calculate the trajectory of an orbit to within 12 significant digits, things like this. These were the kinds of things that, that the very earliest computers did. Unfortunately, they were, they were machines designed for warfare more often than not. But um, the other model for computation, which involved the parallel flow of information through, through neurons, was really designed to mimic what we know, what we even knew in 1948 happened in brains. But at that time, computers were really not powerful enough to implement Uh, meaningful versions of those kinds of, of brains that, that are modeled after, uh, after the physiology of real animals. Quel est le, justement, selon ce, ce modèle, quel est, vous, le premier souvenir Ah, Audrey, you're back. Does it work Just, uh, I finish my, my question for you, Blaise. Um, in fact, 
Ouais, quel est votre premier souvenir, justement, d'une application ou d'une démonstration d'un réseau de neurones euh, et où vous vous êtes dit, là, il se passe quelque chose, de, ça, ça change vraiment la dimension de l'intelligence artificielle What is your, your, the first experiment of a neural network that astonished you and you said, uh, wow, it's, uh, it's a, the beginning of something huge Sure. Uh, I, think that, I think that it was the... It was solving the ImageNet challenge. This happened several years ago. ImageNet is, um, uh, this is very closely related to the problem that I was just telling you about, uh, deciding what is in a photo. Uh, ImageNet is a, a, a database of, of millions of photographs that have all been labeled by hand with what is, what is in there. And this seems like a very simple task to do. It's not, it's not something that, that uh, a three-year-old would have any problems with. But it's something that is absolutely not amenable To the, to, to the kind of serial computation that, that has really dominated computing since its birth. And um, these deep neural nets, which, again, they're very, they're very similar to what's been there from the very beginning of computation, but trained appropriately and using modern computational power are able to say what is in the image. And the fact that they were able to solve this problem that it's so easy for us to solve and that they did it in ways that look very much like the way real brains do it was really very eye-opening to me and made me feel like we're at the, at the brink of a revolution with respect to this technology. Okay, thank you, Blaise. We will uh, come back to a neural network and so on after. So, Audrey, oh, another one is yes, better. Um, I'm sorry for the technical difficulties and because Blaise has a slides uh, that's entirely visual, uh, we have to fix the filming problem. So, uh, we devised a solution. It's your fault, Blaise. No, it's not. Uh, so, like everybody will see kind of my screen this way, and then I will play the slides for place. Uh, you can see my screen, right? Okay, so um, without further ado, <laughs> um, I, I will just play my slides, which is uh, very short, like 15 minutes, and then play, uh, play slides again 15 minutes, if that's okay with you. That's okay. Okay, and uh, film crew will just fill my screen. I mean, this is mirrors of mirrors. <laughs> So, um, I'm <laughs> hey, you see it, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I can see a, a recursive image of my own screen uh, from the mirrors there. So this is actually pretty uh, metaphoric. <laughs> okay. Right. So um, I, I'm happy to be here to talk about the day after tomorrow. And uh, um, the midnight reminds us that we are uh, among the stars. If you uh, look up in the night sky, you see that Earth is a place among the stars. And I've been working uh, with the technology called virtual reality. I have a uh, virtual reality headset here, uh, which you will put on for effect. <laughs> no, no, never mind. Uh, and uh, it enables us to see the space and our relationship to it. thing I've ever seen is the earth from space. On this little ball is everything you've ever known, all the history, all the future, all of the beauty of what it means to be human. The word that everyone uses is fragile, and you can't understand that from the ground because it's not really relevant to you. From the ground, it looks like the sky goes up forever, and from space, it looks very small. Right, so from the space, uh, we all look very small and we are very tightly bound uh, together. We share Earth, all of our problems are of a global scale at the moment, including the climate and everything that people at this night have talked about. And the observer effect makes us able to see the problem on a global scale. My conception of the scale of the reality of the Earth went from being unimaginably large to absolutely finite and in fact small. It goes from infinity to one. I even get goosebumps about this sort of stuff when I talk about it. Even today, it was only after my flight that I began to go, I can't be the only one who's had this sort of reaction. And that's when I discovered this term, the overview effect. And uh, actually, during this whole event, during lunch and during the radio interviews, I've been asking, like Saskin and Suleiman and everybody to put on those goggles and watch uh, us with me together. And this is relevant because uh, when we're facing uh, issues of a global scale, uh, they enable us to think in ways that's uh, different from the ways that we uh, used to think. Um, and yesterday, or really the day before yesterday, the French um, 
Assembly passed a, a very important law, uh, the Republic of Numerique, the Digital Republic Bill. And in the bill that it talks like an overview effect, like on the internet, when seen from the edge of the internet, we see all the transnational issues. But when we are on the internet, we keep the French values. We want to live as what the French people have always uh, valued. Uh, in the cyberspace as well as the physical space. And these values in the act, of course, includes the Internet's primary virtue that everybody can talk to everybody freely, that uh, everybody has the equal access to Internet as its basic human right, and that's whatever we put on the Internet should be secure, should be trustworthy, should not be surveilled, should not be tampered with. And these are the, uh, you know, things value uh, in the real space and the same things we value in cyberspace as well. And uh, when they talked about this bill, there were a very long process of internet consultation. This bill was uh, done with a consultation with the netizens, and everybody voted which act in this bill do they like, do they dislike, why, and they can propose new ideas. And one of the new ideas that changed since the original draft of the bill was that six months from now, the French government must write a report explaining to the parliament, to the assembly, that before uh, we had the Senate, the assembly, but now there is also the internet. The government, when it sends a bill, first to the internet, after deliberation, and then to the assembly. And now the challenge is to figure out how actually to, to implement this, and uh, we have six months of time. Now in Taiwan, uh, one year ago, we started a very similar thing, and I was the uh, facilitator and moderator and architect of the system which we call V-Taiwan, which talk about more or less the same things as the uh, Numeric Republic bills talked about. But as we talk about these things more and more, we think that we discover many things that one nation cannot solve by its own, one place cannot solve by its own. There are problems like Uber, sorry, challenges like Uber and Airbnb, which are of such a global scale that one sovereign entity is not sufficient to talk this problem through. So we use the same internet deliberation methods to talk about those uh, transnational issues. And this is um, what we call it the day before yesterday, because it's past midnight now, right? So the day before uh, yesterday, uh, I was in the streets and I saw the taxi driver on strike and so on. They also waved this flag, says we want the same protections from our nation, but the government is not delivering it and so on. And the tricky thing is that last time when I was in Paris in June or in August, there was the, exactly the same strike, right? It has been going on for a couple of years. <laughs> it, it's not like uh, making visible progress. So while the netizens can deliberate very meaningfully on the uh, Digital Republic uh, issues, uh, the Uber issue still uh, puzzles uh, the, the Parisians. Now, uh, when I talked to the drivers, and I did in the past few days, uh, both the Uber drivers and the taxi drivers, uh, they, they all tell me that the main problem was that they don't think they have the same information the government is having. One driver told me that they think that the government is only talking to the lobbyists in the private sector, or if the civic society can enter it, it's just with through one or two committee members who does not really have a representative power to the rest of the civil society. So while the civil society has solidarity and it links itself together and so on, it, because it doesn't have the same decision information that the government has, uh, there is no trust between people with uh, asymmetry of information. So how do we solve this problem? How can we feel uh, the position of each other? benefit if we all had a shared experience of this kind. Virtual reality is very well positioned right now to start being able to give truly immersive experiences that make you feel like you're there. The difference between a flat video and VR is the difference between watching a football game and being in the stadium. It wasn't until I experienced virtual reality that it became clear to me that it's one of the missing pieces in the puzzle of how we get everybody to understand the beauty of space. The overview effect has such a profound impact that once you've seen it, there is no going back. So uh, there is one saying in politics that where you stand depends on where you sit. 
if we all sit in our respective driver's seats, so to speak, uh, we uh, of course argue for the thing that we stand. There is no uh, neutral space, a mediation space where we can see other people's viewpoints. And so this is why it's so important to have internet where we can, on the internet, have a non-violent way for the civic society to participate in the dialogue that used to be only between the government and the private sector because the government can say a part of internet is now a space of mediation where everybody can enter. One of the very good examples is the worldwide views on the COP21 uh, because on last June, uh, the same day, more than a hundred uh, countries uh, worldwide have the debate at the same time from the civil society, just citizens sitting down and look at the agenda of the COP21 and see uh, what they think about it, how they feel about it, and they are all uh, aggregated on the internet. Now, uh, France is very special because it has 14 different debates going on at the same time, one for the each region. Right? But in Taiwan, although technically we only had one debate, we actually had three. Uh, we had one in Taipei, one in Taichung, and one in Tainan in the three different cities in Taiwan. But the trick is that for each city, we have a hall of about this size with 100, 100 people, but then we install two walls that are very large projector screens so that when you look to the left, you see the other city people. When you look to the right, you see to the other city people. It's like the three cities are linked together. And we stood together and we danced to the same music and so on. It's as if that we're in the same room, just a larger room. And another innovation that Taiwan did was that in addition to the COP21 agenda, the civic society also proposed their own agenda about the climate, about the local issues. And one of the three uh, mayors, Mayor Lai Ching, the uh, have then agreed that this is a very good idea. So from there on, any controversial issues according to the development uh, needs that has the ecological issues must be deliberated uh, in a very similar way involving the civil society using a deliberative forum like this and kept to the record. And this is why we use uh, and we train professional mediators for this purpose because only with professional mediators can we look at the government and the civil society as well as the private sector and share the early stage information so that people can uh, participate with policies before they become problems when they are initially just challenges. And so this brings us to the world of today. This uh, from Wikipedia is a map of Uber around the world. The red means they're illegal, the green dots means the cities that they are legal, and the pink, like in French and in Taiwan, means that they are currently in contention. They are controversial. Right? So uh, we prepared um, this with the Wikipedia community uh, last year, and then we say that we must deliberate this. And people want to deliberate first about Uber and about Airbnb, and then next about Bitcoin. And then uh, the way that we do this is that we crowdsource the agenda from the participation for the internet and that we say we talk about very specific things, just private drivers without private driver's license taking passengers and charging them for it. We don't talk about the sharing economy, the Uber company, or the large narratives, large values. We use an overlapping consensus uh, way to say just one single issue. And then we publish the open data and we guarantee that all the stakeholders, including taxi, Uber, the association, the ministries will sit down and talk like this for two hours using the agenda crowdsourced from the internet. And so this is what we show to everybody in the same time, uh, in the same hour of the day. People see on police um, one single sentiment from their fellow citizens. They can say yes or no. And yes, they say yes or no, their position change among the people. So that initially there's four groups uh, of Uber drivers, taxi drivers, Uber passengers, other passengers, and they have very strong views. But the good thing about this way of reflection is that it lets you see your Facebook friends, your Twitter friends are all over the different camps. They're not enemies. There are people you know, you just didn't know they have such ideas. And so <laughs> that those are not your enemies, those are your friends, and that's one thing. The other thing is that people's position can change. As you answer questions, people can propose new sentiments that are more nuanced, more moderate, and then they get more consensus. They go to the middle and they merge into shared groups. So after three weeks of deliberation, we actually agree on a lot of things that everybody across Taiwan could agree while they couldn't in the first. So we published the open data for independent 
analysis from scholars and from the policymakers and from Uber himself. And then uh, we run a deliberation with all the stakeholders in the same room, looking at the consensus that's formed from the internet and talk on only those points. Right, so that's Minister uh, Jacqueline Tsai, uh, originally from uh, IBM Asia uh, Law Department. So the, the thing is that after this kind of method, we extract promise from all the stakeholders. And if their promise overlap, we have a bill right there. And if we don't, if it needs more clarification, help from the local government and so on, as it currently is, everybody know why Uber is still illegal. And there's no lobbying, there's no, it's totally transparent. Until the promise is met, there's no uh, legalization. And the Airbnb people saw this way, and then they look, took the same deliberation process, except they encouraged all their members to join, and then they agreed on each and every consensus. So it could be made legal. So my point is that with this kind of uh, empowered uh, space, uh, the private sector and the civil society can trust each other in this kind of space, and then they trust the government to propose the early stage idea and upload it to the public deliberation, and the publicly uh, petitioned ideas can also upload into the government, so it becomes a bi-directional link, and we know iterated, repeated bi-directional link are the foundation of trust. Without that, you do not have trust. Oh, well, one of my favorite demos when I first uh, got to try the vibe. I love it. It's, it's one of the best things that I, that I like to show off to people that never tried VR, and it's just it's mind blowing. It's so crazy. It's like more like sculpting in space than painting. It's so bright and vivid in there. It's like the Matrix, man. It's hard to come back out of it. So, um, because of time, uh, I have to rush this a little bit. But the point is that I was just talking with Blaze, and we thought in virtual reality a facilitator can talk with not just 300 people with telecommunication, telepresence. We can talk with 7,000 people as we have here, because people can just put on their Google Cardboard or some other virtual reality and participate virtually as if they are there. And Blaze had this wonderful idea of putting it like shepherding, right? That's how you put it. The facilitator can say, these people are talking about a subtopic so I shepherd you into this small room, a virtual room, and then you go there and deliberate and have consensus and bring it back, and then we can have a larger policy discussion, not just across the three cities in Taiwan, but across uh, nations and across countries as well. So uh, finally, I think this is about a attention, the symmetry of attention. This is my last slide. We won't just be bystanders to history. We will feel like active participants standing side by side with the astronauts. Okay, uh, and so, yeah, it is my wish that this is also a French idea, Lacan says uh, the Borromean knot means that all the three uh, sectors cannot do without each other. If one breaks, everyone breaks, we're in the same earth together. And this is my hope that with the digital democratic tools, we can go closer and closer to this ideal. Thank you very much. Should I share your slides? Thank you, Audrey. <laughs> Changement de slide pour Blaise. Euh, donc Blaise, vous aviez commencé à nous présenter un peu les technologies sur lesquelles vous travaillez et leurs implications politiques. Donc vous allez pouvoir reprendre avec votre présentation. Uh, you have started to explain to us how you worked with uh, intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence. So you could uh, start with your presentation now and uh, about the political consequences of all of that. Thank you very much. Uh, sure. Audrey, thank you so much for, for um, setting, setting us up with a, a suboptimal but functional situation here. Um, 
this, I, I, so I, I really only found out about the work that you are doing uh, today in our, in our earlier conversation, and I, I find it incredibly inspiring. Um, I, I think that what it, what it really, I, I mean, the, for me, what it, really, what it really left is the sense that we need to have both shared architectures that are about use, the use of the Internet to empower people in, in political process. And um, that means that there's something that is centralized and there's something that's decentralized both. Uh, you, you need um, infrastructures that are centralized in the sense, for example, that anybody can type a URL uh, on their computer and get to the same place. And that, that, uh, that requires a degree of centralization. The idea that, that, the, uh, that the Internet is a kind of amorphous gas has, has not been true for a, a very long time and isn't, in fact, a way that, that the Internet can work scalably. At the same time, you have to have the, um, you have to have the agency to be able to participate as an individual. And you know, if, if we really start to think about, about uh, what I think the, the promise and the concern is about the day after tomorrow, a lot of it, in my mind, has to do with striking the balance between, on the one hand, being able to work effectively, collectively, uh, even when we have profound differences of values, uh, even when we, uh, we don't all agree on, on, the, on the principles and, and things like the kind of mediative process that you're suggesting, I think, are, are very powerful tools for doing that. And yet, at the same time that we have this, this mediative and collective um, superorganism, if you like, I think it's also vitally important that we preserve our own individuality and our own agency and our own um, power to be uh, ourselves and to be, uh, to be alone. Uh, and, uh, you know, without being able to be both together and alone, I think we, we sacrifice one of the two halves of what it means to be human. So uh, I, I think, I, I, I know that this was set up as a, in theory as, as some kind of debate, but I, I think uh, we're, in, we're in much more violent agreement than, uh, than not on all of these points. Um, I, don't, I don't know, honestly, uh, Florent, how much, you know, how much value there is in going through the, the, the slides. I think probably the best thing that I can do is um, to, to really move to the, the parts of this that, uh, of course, the most visual parts will also be the most compromised yeah. by doing it this way. But um, I think it's also the most interesting yeah, uh, thing that's in the slides. Um, this past summer has been really the, the season of machine intelligence doing art. And uh, I, I don't know how, how many of you are aware of these, uh, of these developments. That, you know, those of you who, who spend a lot of time on, the, on, on tech sites on the Internet have probably seen these things. Those of you who don't may not have seen. Uh, but it's been a very, very interesting moment because um, we, we think about, about creativity and about imagination and so on as, as being really core human properties that, that are very much not... Uh, connected with, with computers. Computers can be tools, perhaps, but the idea of a computer, for example, being creative or having imagination seems crazy. Um, but, you know, as a, as a computational neuroscientist, which is my original field, somebody who, uh, you know, is not only interested in building things, but in studying brains and understanding how brains work, um, well, I mean, we're, we're, in, we're in Paris. Uh, it's, uh, you're, the, you're the people who wrote uh, L'Homme Machine, right, and books like this that, that, uh, you know, that, that really kicked off the Enlightenment in many ways and, and that posit the idea that we are actually mechanisms. We're, we're, not, we're not some kind of, uh, of, of abstract uh, spirit. And um, our brains work according to physical processes. So, uh, you know, in some sense, of course, everything that we do with our brains can be done uh, with other physical substrates. Um, I mean, to, to not believe that is to, is to be a dualist. That doesn't mean that, um, that there isn't something remarkable and magical about being human and about having a mind. Uh, but it does mean that, that um, I don't think that we are going to have a monopoly on any of those qualities for the indefinite future. And uh, as we understand more and as we build more, we, we will find that all of those parts of what it means to be human uh, are ultimately things that we can uh, construct and create as well as be. So, I think you have an example, just an example yeah. of uh, machine learning doing art. 
Yes, uh, let, me, let me skip all of the expository material and, and, uh, and find something along those lines. Uh, this is just a fun picture that I think that may actually come across in the, in the camera. Uh, this, is, this is a picture of, of Rosenblatt, who was a very early pioneer in computer science, who actually did attempt to implement the, uh, the neuron-based computation model that, that von Neumann and Turing talked about uh, way back in the, in the 40s and 50s. So this device is called the Perceptron, and it's, a, it's actually a physical... Uh, instantiation of a, of, a, of a brain built using wires. Of course, this also shows you why that could not have worked using that, using that technology. He died in 1970. Um, okay, I, this, this, is, um, I, this is maybe just interesting for, for a bit of historical color. Uh, one of the earliest data sets that, that was really used in a systematic way for testing various kinds of machine learning and machine intelligence is called MNIST. And it was, uh, it was put together by, by the US's Bureau of Standards uh, for solving a very, very simple problem, just for, for reading the numbers on, uh, on the zip codes of, of postal addresses. So uh, it's really just uh, designed for testing various different kinds of approaches to reading numbers. And so they commissioned a lot of school children and also teachers to write numbers again and again and again and again in order to have enough data to train all of these kinds of systems and also to test them and see how good they were. And this was the benchmark for many years uh, for all kinds of machine learning uh, approaches. And it got steadily a little bit better, but still actually sort of crappy for many, many years, up until, uh, up until the point when, when we really returned to, to, deep, to deep networks, to networks that were, that were similar in structure to the kinds of things that Rosenblatt had done, but with many more neurons and with the full power of all this training data. And then suddenly this problem was, was immediately solved. Um, the, the way that the solution to the problem looks can be visualized in, uh, in, in these kinds of diagrams, which um, you know, I, don't, I don't want to get too technical, but, but essentially what it amounts to is models of neurons in layers, each one processing a patch of image and feeding forward uh, the, the, the output of that, uh, of that analysis and that patch of image to another layer. And, and so these, these models proceed in layers just like cortical layers, uh, just like layers of cortex in the brain. And what, what I find really most compelling about, about, uh, about these things is not only that they solve these kinds of simple problems better than any previous technology did, but also that they learn to solve them in ways that look very much like what you actually see when you put um, electrodes into the brains of, of rats or macaque monkeys or other animals and observe what happens in real brains when uh, and these are you know, obviously these are experiments with some ethical implications, but they're also very important experiments if you want to understand uh, how these things work. So uh, on what you're seeing here are, are the learned patterns uh, for these artificial neural networks trained to recognize uh, simple images. And what you see on the right are the so-called receptive fields of neurons early in visual cortex of a real animal. And you see that the patterns are essentially the same. So it's, it's, you can see this as a kind of example of convergent evolution if you like, in which we, uh, we design a system that is unconstrained with respect to how it solves the problem, but it has a, a brain-like architecture, and we look at a real system that has solved the problem with a brain architecture, and we see that they've learned how to do this in the same way. Um, and if you look at the responses of neurons higher up in these artificial neural networks, you see sensitivity to more and more sophisticated uh, forms of patterns and shapes and so on. So I, I know I'm, I'm providing a lot, of, a lot of very visual examples. We do obviously more things than, than just the analysis of pictures, but this is easy to show uh, in slides. At least it, it would be easy to show in slides. If, if, uh. Uh, okay, so let me, show you, let me show you what happens if you now take um, one of those kinds of networks and you reverse it. Um, and what I mean by reverse it is you train a network to recognize what's in a picture, but then instead of, instead of using it forward, you use it in reverse. You take a picture that, um, that is um, known. No, let me, let me actually, let me skip style transfer for the moment. Let me go to something else. 
you take a picture that is known, like uh, this one. So this is, there's, this is not a trick image. It's just a, a picture of some clouds in the sky. And you feed them to a neural network that is looking for meaning in this picture. And what, what is meant by meaning here is one of roughly a thousand categories of label, including various breeds of dogs and cars and so on. And, and then you say, well, instead of just telling me what you see, why don't you modify the image in order to enhance the things that you see? Uh, show us what you see in the clouds. And if you do that, you begin to see some patterns emerge in the picture. And progressively, what emerges is something that looks, to my eye, a little bit like a sort of, a, a sort of Buddhist fantasia with all kinds of, of crazy structures appearing in the clouds. Are, are you able to see this on the screen in enough detail to, to make anything out? Uh, that's good. Um, so yeah, these, these, were, these were very, very, these were fascinating and, and surrealistic images. You know, when we first saw them in, in, the, in the beginning of the summer, I, I really was, was blown away. One of, the, one of the researchers who did this work, Mike Taika, uh, realized that, um, that what, this pro what this procedure did was to add detail to images. And so you could try letting the, the, this deep neural network hallucinate or um, free associate by alternating this process with zooming in on the image. And this generates something like a semantic fractal, uh, which looks like, uh, like this. Oh, I, I just I was going to show you one other, one other crazy hallucination that began with a, a surfer and ended with something very strange happening in the sea. Um, here's the zooming, in, uh, the zooming in video. So we start with the clouds, with all kinds of things hallucinated onto them. In stereo. And now, if, if, you, had the, if you had the goggles, and you were seeing this in your left and right eye, something learning. else would be going on. <laughs> uh, is, is, this, is this visible? I, I, again, I, I don't know. Uh, okay, so yeah, this is a very, this is, um, I, I find this utterly fascinating to, to watch. What you really are seeing, uh, you know, I mean, after the first few frames, it's no longer about the original image in any way. Uh, it's, if you like, just a, a fugue or a fantasia that's entirely based on things that have been learned by this neural network from all of the example images that it's seen, and it's a free, it's kind of free associational path through that, through that space of ideas. Um, I, I also think it's important to emphasize that it's, it, this is not somehow drawing from a giant database of images in order to generate this movie. It's not as if there are you know, 500 terabytes of images and they're being pasted on with, with a Photoshop-like operation at all. The neural network that makes this is uh, only a few million uh, weights. In other words, it, it, it's encoded in, in a, a little brain, if you like, that is about the same size as an ordinary picture, like as a single picture that you might take with your, with your mobile phone. Uh, it's just that instead of the pixels in that picture representing the intensities of, of the way light fell on one pixel of the, of, of, the, of the sensor, they're representing the weight of a particular neural connection between one neuron and another. So what, what, I'm, what, I'm, uh, what I'd like to, I mean, if, if you come away with one thing from looking at this, uh, what, what I'd like it to be is really that we start to have these brain-like systems. I, I think that this is profound because everything that we have done in human history so far has, has really been born out of our own minds and our own brains. And um, what, what we start to have now is, is a kind of meta-technology that allows us to bring the same kind of, of power to bear um, to thinking that we, have, that we have born to making. I, let me give maybe a simple, a simple analogy. Um, we do something like cooking or combustion in our own bodies when we eat. Uh, the, the process of cellular respiration is about taking proteins and burning them to make energy for our own bodies. But when we invented cooking fires and we externalized some of that capability, we were able to eat much better and we were able to spend much more of our time doing things that weren't just about getting food. And in many ways, the invention of the cooking fire was really the, the birth of complex human civilization. And I think in some sense, what we start to see here is the birth of cooking fire. Uh, but for thinking. Uh, in fact, um, this uh, technology, uh, it's uh, an important debate. You have uh, talked, both of you, about values embedded in technologies. 
sometimes, sometimes to times, we say that technology is neutral. Is it the case or not? And uh, how do you think that uh, we should, uh, we should uh, work on technology to avoid that, uh, that it, uh, we face some uh, crash, for instance? Okay. Yes. <laughs> Are you, can you handle this? Okay. Uh, I, I don't think that technologies are neutral. Um, I, there, there is a, a, a big um, debate in the U.S. It's, of course, the only industrialized country that is having this debate about guns, right, in which the people in favor of, of, uh, of not having gun control say things like guns are neutral. Uh, pieces of technology and it's people who kill people and not guns. And of course it's, it's generally true that a person has to be pulling the trigger in order for somebody to die at the other end of the gun. But the gun is not a neutral technology. It's a technology that is designed to kill people. There's no other purpose for a gun. So um, as the makers of the technology, we absolutely have a moral responsibility to think about what that technology makes easy or hard, what is natural for it, and what's not natural for it. Any, any technology that's powerful, I think, can be used to do harm. Uh, but uh, in fact, it's a good example because for, for the, 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 the kind of technology you show us about uh, pattern recognition or image uh, recognition, uh, right now we see more and more of this technology used to uh, recognize people, to, uh, to distinguish between the black and white and uh, uh, people who behave some this way or this way. So it's mainly control technologies and not uh, empowerment technologies. So how, how could you uh, avoid that? You, I mean, because you are, uh, these technologies are coming from a huge corporation like Google. So how can you and how can the government uh, shape that, uh, that kind of technologies in yeah, a, a with mobile question. value? The ability to recognize people from, their, from an image of their face and recognize a bunch of their characteristics of their, of their, um, uh, of their, of the same kinds of characteristics that you or I would see when we look at a person's face is in itself a neutral technology. Uh, I mean, I, I say that it's neutral because it, it really is just about an algorithm perceiving things from an image that we perceive ourselves with our own eyes and brains. What's not neutral is where that technology is put and what it's used for. So, for example, if, if that's running locally on your own device, I mean, let's, let's imagine uh, for the moment um, that you have a retinal implant that, um, that runs the FaceNet algorithm, which, by the way, is also one that our team developed. All right, so FaceNet uh, takes a picture of a face and represents it as a small set of numbers that are unique to, to that face. So if the face is from another point of view or lit differently, it'll, it'll resolve to the same numbers. This can be very, very useful if it's implanted in your retina uh, and you meet many people and you forget their names the way I do because uh, I, could, uh, I, could, I could hear or I could perhaps see the name tag, the reminder, uh, and this would make me much less socially awkward in a lot of different situations. If, on the other hand, we take the same exact technology and we um, attach it to all of the cameras that are surveilling the street corners in London, then we have a, a massive surveillance technology for tracking everybody wherever they go in the city. And that's, that's not okay. Right? So one of these applications is, is, I think, quite sinister and quite invasive of people's privacy and agency. And the other one is, I think, purely empowering for uh, at least you know, certain classes of people who meet a lot of others and are not very good with names and has really very few downsides. So in this case, I think a lot has to do with not what the brain does, because it's the same thing that our brains do, but where that brain runs and who owns the brain and where does the output of it go. Uh, so those are, those are, you know, exactly the same kinds of questions that arise from cameras. Yeah, of course. Just a quick word. Uh, in, in the beginning of the free software uh, movement, uh, Richard Stallman, who started this idea of uh, free software, uh, defined four different kind of freedoms about software. The 
uh, first, the second, and the third freedom uh, is to take a program and you know to modify it, to distribute it, and so on. But that became the open source movement, uh, which we now everybody knows about the open data, open source, and so on. But the zero, the zero's freedom that Stallman defined, he called it freedom zero. It means uh, the freedom of doing things with software that affects primarily yourself. Because he thinks if you have a software and its effect affects everybody, tens of thousands of people, it's no longer freedom, it is power. Uh, and the freedom has a very narrow definition. That means that the software's decisions enhance yourself, but then it affects primarily you. This is the only word I like to add. Et cela dit, c'est très juste, mais dans le, dans le, le monde d'aujourd'hui, parce que là on parle du monde d'après-demain, mais dans le monde d'aujourd'hui, la tendance c'est plutôt à centraliser les technologies et à les cacher. Euh, en général, les ordinateurs sont gros, certes en réseau, mais ils sont très loin des gens. De plus en plus, on utilise le cloud, donc on n'est pas maître de nos données. Euh, donc là, pour le coup, on est assez loin justement de ce que vous avez l'air de, 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 de défendre tous les deux. We are very far from a decentralized organization and uh, everybody can own and control the technology. But all the technology is centralized, heavy, by corporation or government, both. Uh, we are very far from that. Well, I'm not sure how far we are from that. Um, I, I think that we, um, the situation is, is, uh, is not necessarily as you see it in the sense that, for example, an Android phone is uh, an incredibly powerful computing device, which when you buy it is yours. And, um, Anything, any software that you run on this device that executes locally is your software running on your data. So, uh, you know, the, the fact that, that the last 10 years have seen a, a flowering of web technologies that involve services, uh, I think is, uh, you know, I mean, many of these services do amazing things that, that, that we, we didn't have before. I'm, I'm a very frequent user of Google Docs, for example, I, I find it amazing that I'm able to collaborate with somebody with a Google Doc across the world, and we can each see what we're typing on this doc right, as, we, as we go. And this is a capability that, um, you know, that either requires some kind of instantaneous peer-to-peer -peer transport of the data between those devices, or that, that, that they be stored on a server somewhere. And you know, obviously, the, the, the things that come from it being stored on a server somewhere are very, very powerful. But um, That doesn't mean that this is the only paradigm that needs to exist. We, we already have vast amounts of computing power in our purses and in our pockets. A lot of the software does run in our purses and our pockets. So I think this is, frankly, um, a learned helplessness more than it is a, a fact. Yes, again, just one word uh, from me. Uh, we have a existential proof <laughs> in the form of a project that is sponsoring work with some free software people. It's called Sandstorm. And what it does is that it flips the default. It makes it possible to think of the web like you install apps on your phone. And by default, it's secure, it's sandboxed, it can only run on a server you trust, and so on. So you still do you know, the typing together. This is like Google Doc, and I designed this uh, Uh, spreadsheet with Denver Clean called either calc is like Google spreadsheet but the difference is that it's on a server that you trust you control and at any point that you can download everything it's called data portability and then put it to the friend's server if your own computer has a hardware problem you can migrate uh, with no problem at all so the point is that we change the default we flip the default now with this way of doing things we still go on coding but now it's secure and uh, free by default that's my only point euh, une, une dernière question pour, pour Clore, c'est une question assez, assez générale et, et très pessimiste, c'est qu'est-ce qui peut mal tourner C'est-à-dire que tous les deux, pour le coup, vous avez un, un point commun, euh, vous êtes des, des optimistes. Uh, you, you are believers in technology, you are strongly optimists about that, uh, you think that we are capable of, of doing stuff, interesting stuff with that. Uh, if you have only one fair, something could go ugly with technology. What, what, que ce serait? what would do? Uh, what could turn ugly? Well, I, I think that the the most disastrous thing that I know of right now 
that is happening as a consequence of our technology is uh, the destruction of our ecosystem, actually. Um, I mean, I, there are other scenarios that we can hypothesize about in the future, but this is one that we know is happening now and is a direct consequence of our technology. And, and it's, it's a consequence of our, of our wealth. I mean, we wouldn't have these kinds of impacts on our ecosystem if it weren't for the massive increases in output of farming and the, the, the discovery of, of fertilization from hydrocarbons and, and so on and so forth, right? So, and all of these things have been, have allowed us to explode our population in ways that would have been impossible otherwise. There are more people rising out of extreme poverty now than ever. Uh, so, you know, even though wealth inequality is, is an enormous problem and is growing, uh, it's also the case that extreme poverty is well on the road to being eradicated which is an extraordinary achievement. Uh, there's much less suffering in the world now than there ever has been before. At the same time, we, we are living unsustainably. And uh, so my big fear is that we fail to use our technology and our governance to manage our own environment in such a way that we achieve a sustainable state. Uh, I, I think there's no question that this is the, the biggest failure mode that faces us over the next century. Thank you, Blaise. Audrey? Uh, can I take two minutes? Two time? minutes. Yeah, two minutes. Start counting. No. Um, I, I was just uh, talking with Saskia Sassen about that on a, a radio show a, a few hours ago, and uh, she has this idea of expulsion, right? People uh, just dislocate because of the ecological impact and the governmental issues that Blaise just described, and the effect is that they fail off the statistics. We don't see them from the GDPs anymore. We don't see them from any of the numbers anymore more because they stopped registering become they were dislocated. And so um, I would echo that I think the greatest danger is that we stop uh, seeing, we stop uh, reflecting uh, in that uh, our vision which we have for the future becomes a tunnel vision of a future that only allows one possibility and excludes uh, everybody out. And uh, because I know that during the night everybody is reading poetry and so on, <laughs> I, I have a very short uh, poetry of uh, a minute and a half that I like to uh, read uh, for you that talks about uh, reflections. So again, we do this thing. Yeah. Um, this is uh, a reading in English, I think, through uh, radio and television. Um, one person can speak to millions of people. And now, for the first time, internet let us listen to millions of people. Uh, like um, many of you, I'm a digital migrant. 22 years ago, I migrated to the internet when I was 12 years old. In cyberspace, just as in the physical space, the migrants, new migrants, have much to learn from the aborigines together. And our way of learning together is through open data and through open space. Open data turns the raw measurements into social objects. People can gather around rules, budgets, regulations, and through this way that we can talk about these things, just like talking about today's weather, about the climate. And then the open space fuses our feelings into this shared uh, reflective space. And in this reflective space, we gradually discover each other. Uh, we become a kind of a crowd, the demos in democracy. So uh, transparent, like a glass, reflective, like a mirror. These are the two democratic characters of the digital internet. And we, the um, early inventors of the, uh, digital democratic tools in the early 21st century, are much like the inventors of reflective telescopes in the 17th century. Uh, we're very eager to explore the stars. We're full of innovations. Um, personally, I'm very happy to have the space in the Night of Ideas here to share these ideas and learn from uh, the entire world because only through uh, from learning each other can we truly enter the age of science and then eventually beyond it into an age of reflection. Thank you.
Là, on est passé donc du, du machine learning au human learning. Merci beaucoup euh, Audrey, merci beaucoup Blaise et merci beaucoup euh, à tout le monde. Et donc c'est là que ce débat se termine et cette soirée, je crois. Merci à tous.